has some practical implications uh, for us, both as information consumers and information providers. Uh, and one of the things that I'm going to push very hard on this evening is the idea that far more than giving us all the capability to be information consumers, that that gives us the capability of being information providers in a way that is extremely economical and potentially beneficial to all of our institutions on a shared resource basis. But back to those 22 million people, whoever they are, it makes it very easy as a practical matter to form a community of interest around virtually any issue, virtually any substantive, you know, any, any subject you want, really. If you want to go out and start a list or discussion group, and we'll get to that later, uh, you know, for left-handed, red-handed architects, you can do that. Because out of 22 million people, you're going to find out to send mail to each other about things that left handed red handed architects care about, whatever those may be. Uh, very, very, very important thing to keep in mind as we look at this technology. Uh, there's a lot Now, those of you who identified yourselves a few minutes ago as completely ignorant about the internet are liars. Uh, because one of the things I've discovered doing training is that almost nobody is totally ignorant of what they expect from an online data service. And that in fact, as I've done training, I, I, I've found that if I were dealing with people who really were completely ignorant, life would be a lot easier. Uh, as it is, I mean, just for laughs, how many people in this room have had object? I expect every hand to go up. Who's dealt with Westlaw and Lexus? All right, yeah. So you've got some expectations about what's going to come over your screen when you access a remote, a remote data service at some time. Uh, how many of you have used dial-up BBSs in some form or other? See, so there's some really some, there are really some expectations, and they run deeper than you might think about what you're going to find uh, when you go out there. And I've characterized them in this little drawing over here. Uh, this is your brain on Weston Mead. <laughs> brain on the internet. Any questions? Uh, uh, well, it does, it does in a way. And, and people do come in with a set of expectations. So before I really sit down and beyond giving you those lovely numbers, say, well, this is what the internet is, I, I'm sure there are some opinions out there. I mean, who, who wants to offer a definition of the internet, even from the world's most naive perspective? We need a volunteer from the audience. Network. 
because it's operated by the University of Minnesota Law School Network, because it's operated by uh, high energy physicists. Uh, and that, that, that's really the sort of thing you're getting at. So, so what's the internet? Well, it's a lot of machines that are operated by everybody and nobody at the National Science Foundation, kind of, sort of. That's an actual quote from somebody at NSF. Uh, Okay. In terms of overall organization, so there's a network of networks. Here I have my little local area network, more about law school, which feeds into a bigger network called Kaisernet. In turn, connected to something called the NSF Backbone, the National Science Foundation. As I look around the United States and elsewhere, I can find other so-called mid-level regional networks uh, like CICNet and uh, what are there, seven of them now in the United States uh, or more? Each of which is a network that serves various smaller networks and serves various smaller networks and ultimately is all up together, at least in the United States, by the NSF backbone and by uh, connections to the NSF uh, backbone elsewhere. So it's a hierarchical structure. Way, where networks are no longer defined so much by hardware standards as they are by who's running. Uh, this is an issue that for you as a user of the network is not going to be really important except in the context of certain political debates that are going on right now about who's going to operate them and what they're going to charge for. We can talk about that later. I don't really want to get into it because it pretty much has to be that I have no opinion. Uh, for, for, for one reason or another. There is a lot of talk right now about who is going to do this. As networking services become available to households in the United States, I, I was told something today, a John Mayer told me that by 1995, we can expect three quarters of the households in the United States will have access to data networking services at the wall jack. Uh, the scale of it is, is, is much more. Uh, one statistic I didn't throw at you earlier, the rate of growth of this thing is estimated at 15% per month in terms of end users. If you work out the compound interest expansion, that comes to 535% per year. Uh, Let me uh, take even more of a digression than I already have so far and ask I mean, an obvious question is, what's in this for you? Uh, what can law schools derive from this? What can you personally derive from this? And, and actually, I'd sort of like to sample the room. Uh, why are you here? I, mean, I need a touch of the, the library aspect of um, computers, hardware, and that. <coughs> so you're coming from a librarian's perspective, and you're confused about Computers, hardware, how does all this stuff work? I do hardware. You do hardware. I don't do library. And you don't do library. Okay. Uh, how about a librarian who doesn't do hardware? Do you have, do you have any of those? Anybody else want to volunteer a reason why they're here? I'm going to start picking people around. Sure. Yeah, somebody's going to ask me. Uh, who is that person like to be? Uh, you're about 1,500 or so. Where is home, by the way? Yeah. I'll tell you that one of the reasons I ramble so much is that I didn't 
with all due credit to myself, it is ferociously difficult to explain this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> you made the mistake of moving your head at the wrong moment. <clears throat> well, um, our school cooks the internet, and a few faculty members have it. But when I'm trying to get my law students to be interested in it, they say, why should I take time learning this? What's, what's on the internet for me as a law student? I don't know. Let me, let me take a moment to specifically address that question <clears throat> in the context of something I said a minute ago. And, and my way of specifically addressing it is to tell you quite bluntly that I'm not going to specifically address it, but, but, but let me tell you why. Something that I have noticed in people who are new to that, particularly if they've had experience with Lester Lexus, is this idea that there is out there, in one location, some sort of informational holy grail that if they can but discover it, is going to tell them everything they want to know and only what they want. This ought to sound familiar to some of you who can't believe it. And these people believe that the business and purpose of computer groups such as myself is to hide this from them. Uh, in fact, this is not the case. It's not there. There's technology there that would let that be one sort of virtual space over the whole net. We'll look at some of that later. But there ain't no such thing. And the people who come in wanting easy answers, you know, I got five minutes, tell me everything you know about this and how it's going to be useful. You know, uh, sorry, no deal on, on, on some level, but there, there is help, uh, and, and we'll get to that. I haven't yet picked on any victims from the back row. Uh, <laughs> let's see what we have to say. Uh, you moved your head at the wrong time. Uh, I'm trying to find out what like she is, how, how I can go back to the law school and tell director of the law school, what the internet can do to help the students uh, research, find things out about the law, uh, communicate abroad, and what's out there that will help them. For myself, I, I just use it to communicate with people back and forth. I know what I'm looking for, what I'm looking for, but I don't know how to tell somebody else how to look. Uh -huh. well, contact all of these other computers, there's all this information on them, you can access that information. That doesn't really tell them much about how much substantive value that information has, or, or really much about anything other than here's a telephone, you can use it to do lots of neat stuff, with you know, no guarantees about who they're going to be talking to on the other end. Uh, and it, I, I think people find that a little bit bewildering a little bit but I, I certainly do. Uh, it's probably useful to look at how things got that way a little bit. Uh, Sylvia mentioned a sort of smorgasbord of internet tools that everybody's heard of. I mean, a lot of you did know that anonymous FTP was not a sexually transmitted disease, and she mentioned telemed, and we'll, we'll mention a bunch of others. The reason things became, in a way, so sort of split up in terms of the internet tools that are available to you, and we'll go through a whole catalog of them in a minute, uh, is simply this. The people who did the original research work on the internet came largely out of the University of Computer Science Department. They came largely uh, out of a Unix operating system background. And it has always been a matter of religion with those people uh, that one should build software tools that were as narrowly focused as possible that did things in sort of a, a, an aesthetically perfect way, and that were totally user hostile. Uh, so what you ended up with was, because you wouldn't want any non geeks for any club, right? <laughs> uh, so what you really ended up with was this set of software tools for dealing with the net that are kind of as if someone had taken word perfect and said, well, I'm going to write the thing that does the internet. And then we'll have a separate program that does the spell check. And we'll have yet another one that formats text. And we'll have yet another one that does this and another one that does that. That idea of product integration that you find in the commercial marketplace, we just completely announced it to you because anybody who needed a thesis wrote a new work of the 
Uh, there, you know, there was there was a huge there was a huge amount of that out there, and the end result has been that not only do you have uh, 25 software tools for 24 purposes, but you have local variation of all of them. I mean, I'm sure some of you have bumped up against the well, is it Clarkson Telnet or NCSA Telnet or is it TN 3270 problem? Uh, yeah, you know, it's very much an option of that. Some of it was linked to different hardware standards, but there was this, you know, sort of awful proliferation of what I'm going to call now the handouts are up there. Uh, first generation internet tools. Uh, these tools, I, the, the division into generations is really a sort of an abstraction that I picked up from John Mayer. It's not, it's not a bad one. Uh, it's vaguely historical. I would divide the available software tools into roughly four generations at this point with the understanding that, you know, there are some shading there. Across generations one through four, for example, there has been a steady improvement in user friendliness. There has been a steady improvement in user interfaces, not really related to other capabilities. It's just gradually gotten better over time, so it's not really a reason to identify something as belonging in one Looking at different categories of things within each generation, they fall broadly into two. One is something I will call CMC, or Computer Mediated Communication. That's a fancy way of saying mail, but it takes in some other things as well. Uh, the other is something that you could broadly classify as resource sharing, although that gets to be a somewhat trickier distinction because it takes in sharing of all kinds of resources like peripherals, I want to work on this computer and print out from that computer over there. Uh, data storage, I want to use this other guy's hard disk because I'm out of space. Uh, CPU time, I want to take part of the processing job and shove it over to this computer over here so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, you know, any kind of resource, hardware, software, or otherwise, you can imagine being offered by a computer could be shared under a resource sharing scheme, and that's why it's kind of a sure. It's a nice aesthetic taxonomic division, but it's so broad in some ways it's universally useful. Uh, library catalogs are in fact a resource sharing application. We're sharing this guy's database over here that happens to contain bibliographic records or, or, or what have you. So it, it, it's really pretty close. So four generations of software going this way, broad division into CMC and resource sharing applications going this way. I could broad this uh, I think we're done with this. First generation tools. First generation tools are mail, which you all know. Use that news, which you somewhat know. On the CMC side. On the resource sharing side, our friend Anonymous FTP and a program called Telnet. What do these things do? Well, mail is mail, and we'll get to it in a minute because it sort of leads to some other things in the first generation. Here's that news. How many of you have had some contact with that? Okay, not very many. Use that news as quickly as I can state it is a system whereby a user can post a message much as you would on a physical bulletin board. I can use that with dial up uh, and have that posting propagated from machine to machine across the net automatically in sort of a flooding way, right? You post it on your local machine which relates to two more machines, to two more machines, to two more machines. Within a day or two, it's all over the net. Uh, that, of course, when you have, what did I say, 24 million users? could be a bit confusing unless you imposed some sort of hierarchy on how the messages were organized. So they very quickly got to a concept of news groups, which were focused on particular topics, obviously many of them in computer sciences, and then with up to a hierarchy within that. So one of the news groups I read, for example, might be uh, called comp.lang.pearl, which is a news group having something to do with computers, and in fact with computer languages, and in fact with a specific computer language called Perl. Uh, and there's comp.lang.other things, and comp.other things, other things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's some 
high levels of nuisance within that. Again, a very simple motion. You posted a text file to your local machine and it got processed uh, throughout the system. And of course, as more and more people do that, it takes on the aspect of the discussion. Somebody posts a notice saying, you know, the sky is red. Someone else posts a notice saying, no fool, you're wrong. And the discussion sort of <laughs> proceeds from there. Uh, Mail is mail, as I said, we understood that. FTP is a nice little acronym for File Transfer Protocol. Oops, oops, there's that awful word, protocol. Uh, you're going to hear it a lot, and it's probably smart to stop right now and, and talk about what the protocols are. I had in mind, actually, at one point, doing a live demonstration this evening, but I'm not going to push you through that. Uh, what I want you to do, however, is think about the last time you ordered a pizza. Uh, now, one thing I have noticed is that every time I order pizza, no matter who I order pizza from, or what pizza I order, or what color telephone I use to order pizza, the structure of the conversation is basically the same. I mean, have you noticed this from Pizzeria to Pizzeria? I mean, is this, is this true or am I making this up? Uh, so, one might, in fact, if one were a true internet geek, advance something that one calls the pizza ordering protocol, which is a specified series of sequential challenges and responses by which one orders pizza. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what a protocol is. It's a specified series of statements and responses between machines by which data is, is, is transferred, services are requested, and so forth and so on. So if you thought there was anything mystical about that word, there is a it's really very simple. It's just a means by which uh, machines have an agreed set, a, a, an agreed way of holding a conversation about some data resource. Hey, shoot me some data. Sorry, ain't got it. Or hey, shoot me my some data. Fine, give me a password. Okay, here. I mean, literally, this is this is this is what's going on. Uh, that's what protocol is. And FTP is a protocol used for file transfer. The actual specification of the protocol says very little about what it should look like to the end user. It's simply a way for machines to talk. And however people have chosen to write software that accomplishes that is pretty much up to them beyond a very, very minimal user hostile command set that uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. Uh, it basically specifies the you know, This is what I must be able to request from the other machine. And, and, and that's really all. So FTP, nice primitive tool for file transfer, it grew, we'll get to that in a second. Telnet, same idea, very basic protocol to accomplish uh, remote login. Uh, remote login, what a nice term. What, what remote login is effectively is the ability to poke the keyboard of another machine with a very, very long stick. <laughs> right? Uh, and to log into it as if it were sitting on your desktop. It's, it's, it's a turn. You're, you're acting as if you were a terminal on that machine. And in fact, uh, both Lexus and Westlaw can in some sense be thought of as remote login applications. All you're doing is using their communication software to use a very long stick to poke the keyboard in case they're in Minneapolis perspective. Uh, it also has some file transfer capabilities, but I think you get the general idea. Interactive access to another machine via your keyboard, but all of the computing processes that are running to retrieve that data and answer your requests and so forth are really running on the other machine. Uh, like I say, a very long stick of which to the keyboard. Uh, some things arose out of first generation services, uh, and let's go back to FTP for a second. Uh, FTP incorporated the idea of authentication term you'll hear me use a lot. Uh, most of you who are system administrators know that this idea of verifying that a user is who they say they are and controlling data security in that way has always been kind of inextricably bound up with chargebacks and other accounting procedures. In fact, for a long time we've referred to users as accounts. Uh, there was this idea that uh, security and the ability to charge for data services were sort of inextricably intertwined. And FTP did indeed build that in. They said, well, we have this file transfer protocol, but we need to be able to control who can transfer what. So there were mechanisms built into a task for passwords and so forth and so on. And then somebody said, well, hey, wait a minute. I've got all of this stuff, all of these files that I would like to make available to the world. 
And I don't care if it's free. Uh, and I don't want to have to worry about authentication. I just want to put them out there in some spot on the net so that anybody who ever can grab them. For example, you know, your library pathfinder or paper you just wrote or whatever. I want anybody to be able to get it. Then. So out of that came the notion of so-called anonymous FTP, which was the ability to go and access this stuff, essentially giving the universal user ID anonymous without any password, and therefore be able to grab this stuff. So out of FTP through anonymous FTP, uh, and sort of refinement that let people run the internet equivalent of, of the BBS system you're probably familiar with that don't demand any high degree of technology from you are. There were similar developments on the mail front very quickly after email became a reality. Uh, there arose the idea that you could have a mail exploder. And what a mail exploder did, simply enough, was take a piece of mail sent by someone to a particular electronic mailbox, grab the thing, and explode it back out to a preset distribution, essentially a group mail distribution. This stuff is something you've all seen uh, Then somebody got the bright idea of, well, why should I be sitting here maintaining all these distribution lists if I can't? If I want to put somebody else in the group, why should I be editing some text file somewhere to tell the computer who should be in the group? And someone had to write it. Well, if we had a second mailbox that they could send messages. And within those messages were embedded little commands. We could have them sign themselves on and sign themselves off. And we wouldn't have to maintain these things by hand anymore. And that is precisely the derivation of what most of you know as a listserv software. How many of you are signed up on some sort of listserv? Uh, and that was exactly the idea, a controlled mail exploder that could be uh, sort of self-administered by the end user by sending mail messages that had preset understood commands in it. Preset understood commands, incidentally, that happened to be different for the two prevalent list systems and how we use. But, uh, but, but nonetheless, little, little command strings embedded in mail messages. And there were all kinds of embellishments on that basic idea. There are people doing database retrievals now by sending mail to a particular mailbox where the big mail message arrives, is copied, some program looks at it and says, oh, that's a database query. And it goes and grabs something out of the database and mails it off to the guy who sent it to the request. Uh, so you can have all kinds of little mail robots that operate on this principle. The best known one, of course, is the surface, but, but there, are, there are others. And that was really it. That was that was the first generation of internet apps, uh, circa what, well, 1986, something like that. <laughs> Another liar. Uh, the second generation dealt with the deficiencies of the first. <laughs> uh, there started to be, particularly, a lot of these anonymous FTP sites where people were posting stuff. And for those of you who haven't experienced the wonders of this, using anonymous FTP is kind of like dropping in on someone else's hard drive at a random point in the directory structure with only DOS commands available to you to figure out what the hell is going on and what they've got stored there. Uh, this is an ugly experience, <laughs> to say the least. And it's particularly not a very good way to go hunting for something. I mean, now, this was fine when there were two or three anonymous FTP sites because if George didn't have a friend and, and so forth and so on. But you know, you start getting up into the thousands and it gets a little tedious to go looking for something. Uh, so the next, the, the second generation are what I really call, and what we'll see on the handout, uh, called locators. Uh, they were really services that made it possible to locate other resources that you then access with one of these tools. Uh, the one for FTP is called Archie. The Arch in Archie comes from Archive Server, which is another name for okay, no, no, no. There's another name for an FTP site. Uh, it was written by a couple of guys at McGill. And what it basically does is run around to every FTP site that they tell about it. Uh, tell it about every so often, build up a big database of all the file names in there, and allows you to do a text search on it. You fire a query off to this thing saying, show me every file name on every FTP site you know about the method that has cats. And, and presumably out of this, you get back, 
big list of sites and files and so forth and so on. It mentions everything about cat. Well, it mentions the steam for media now. You don't know how deep we're naming your files. Uh, under Unix, at least, they have a little more room to name them in than you can do with boss, 255 characters in both cases as opposed to the left. Uh, but it is nonetheless, you know, a list of some rather cryptically named things. Uh, but it was better than nothing, and it's still better than nothing, and a lot of people use it. Telnet, there was never really a locator for Telnet other than paper, paper lists. Some of you have probably seen uh, with, with that. How many of you have seen either the Billy Barron or the Art of St. George list of, of OPACs of, uh, of library catalog? Yeah, I mean, there were people, many of them librarians, who compiled actual lists of things that you could remotely log into on particular substantive topics. One of the most common ones was online library catalog or, or, or so called LPEG. Uh, so the locator for that was really kind of uh, really kind of on paper, mostly. Although there were a couple of other folks, uh, people at Washington University and Sonoma State, who wrote software that concentrated access to other telnet sites. The idea is that you fire up one of these things, you show you a menu, you pick from the menu. Uh, you, you work your way down through libraries in the U.S., New York, Cornell, oh, okay. And then it offers you a telnet session to that OPEX with a way of menuizing telnet access. And those are still operating and they're very, very popular. Our interlibrary loan people go for Zerko in this because obviously you have a way to get a lot of other people's catalogs. So in that category you also have, you also have stuff like the one, uh, the one at Washington University is called Boogie. Uh, they're known generically as, as, as gateways. So you have the Now, mail. Ah, mail. And that's probably the most frequently asked first time end user question about the internet. And I will pose it to you. How do you find somebody's email address on the net? Call them up. <laughs> <laughs> Best first answer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Let them send you mail first. <laughs> yeah, this is the high school dance approach. <laughs> I, uh, there's a ringer in the back there. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that was the same one. You, you ask them, basically, is the most efficient. Uh, otherwise? You wait for an information professional to write a directory. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you can use who is, or you can use, uh, but still, you're, you're, it's a shot in the dark. The fact is that at the moment there is no universal, comprehensive, reliable directory service for email on the internet. There are, there's a lot of ad hoc stuff operating. The best known is probably a program known to actually as a series of programs called CSO. Uh, comes out of the University of Illinois, and in fact, the CSO and CSO stands for Computer Services Organization, they're the people who wrote it. Uh, they wrote it as a way of doing phone book style information for 60,000 people on, uh, on the UI campus, and a lot of other universities picked up on it uh, as a good way to deliver this kind of information. There are other services that look at CSO and that try to organize CSO, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, but when all is said and done, even with the perfect sort of software robot out there that knew how to run around and look for everybody's email address, you would still be at the mercy of local maintainers. And well, let's put it this way. Uh, hands up anyone in this room who believes that their campus paper phone book is accurately maintained. <laughs> OK, so you know, I, I rest my case on how good these services are likely to get. I, obviously, they're only as good as what you put in. But it, it's true, people have unbelievably unrealistic expectations of this technology. I'm mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, they really believe that somehow it's going to be better than the services very good way. And as, as I say, we have not yet learned to build telepathy into the technology. And, uh, and that's really what you need to solve the problem. Yeah? Is anybody doing anything, though, with <clears throat> um, listserv memberships where we have, we the users, have been the one to submit the directory information to the listserv administrator when we joined the thing. And wouldn't there be a way to compile a lot of mailing addresses with human names by looking at uh, maybe automatically at listserv rosters? Uh, yes, but I 
<clears throat> yes, there would be, and things like that have been done. The uh, NetFind service out of Colorado actually does what it does by looking at email traffic across the net and figuring out where it came from. It doesn't really assign names to it, but it does give you a way of locating people. However, before we get too head up about going out and writing this program, uh, I know there are a lot of librarians in the room. How many of you divulge your circulation card? <laughs> Do you see the point? I'm yeah, making? it's an obvious problem. Uh, people don't always want to know who's one for one. But it's not your circulation it's record, it's your address. It's, it's not what you got out about building a bomb, it's where you live. But, specific, but specifically on the subject, I agree with you, and yes, that privacy issue does get raised. In fact, it got raised by Ken Hirsch with me at one point uh, when, you go, when you go to an email directory. But specifically taking them from listserv subscriptions, I think many people would find to be invasive. I mean, uh, it's listing all your library users. But if, if, it is a list, if, if it is a list serve that deals with eccentric sexual practices, I doubt that anyone particularly wants that to But if it divulges, I mean, they wouldn't necessarily have to divulge that I'm Bert on King Street Sex Bash L. <laughs> <laughs> but, if, but if it told the world that Birch at UR Max is Paul Birch, that might be different. There are a lot of, well, Tell the nice people, Kevin. I mean, we raised this with, with, with Duke a while ago. We wanted, we wanted faculty email addresses. Well, there are a lot of people who have private phone numbers, and the same people pretty much might like to have private email addresses. So only the people they want to hear from, they hear from. And you have to realize, too, that junk fax is here, so it's not very long before junk email will be here. And uh, the last three, there's a listserv command called review where you can ask the system to give you the name of every person who is on that listserv, but that has two limitations. One is there's another command that says set my options so people can't review my name. And the last three listservs I tried to get lists from, the administrators had set it so that only the administrators could look at the list. So there are a lot of limitations there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The privacy issue is obviously a large one. It's larger with some people than with others. We began a project last summer about this time to do an email directory for all law faculty and law librarians in the United States. We did the CSL. It's, it's running on our go for a fair number of you have seen it. Uh, and we did encounter this objection quite a lot. We want to control who knows about our, our address. And a lot of it, is, as Ken says, we're the same people who would have private phone numbers in the way of search status. Uh, I did hear one rather interesting objection raised by our, uh, our, dean, our dean of students, actually, who made, I think, the very valid point, and I, we've all done this, I, I certainly do it now still, uh, raised a very interesting point that while she had no objection to students having email access to her for whatever purpose students would have access to her for whatever, she was fearful that electronic mail creates an expectation of a speedy response, which they might not get, and in any case might not be appropriate on some issues. Uh, and about that I think she was actually right. I mean, we've all done this, right? You fire the method box, even though you know damn well the guy lives in California, he's not out of bed yet. Uh, and you're expecting an answer in the next 30 seconds, right? I, I've done this, and uh, I assume pretty much everybody else has. Uh, and I think in that she was right that there really is a problem with, with setting up that expectation that there is going to be some very bad things when you use that particular medium. And the newer the user is to the medium, the worse the expectation is. Uh, I think supposedly we're not trying to be real real about that. It, it, is, it is kind of a pitfall. The latest thing that happens is I go to getting on a field server, finding in the PS department. I mean, <clears throat> I suppose that a little later on we can talk about the issue of the internet and Wild West and uh, some of the ethical and privacy issues involved, but they are substantial and they are even more substantial in situations where it has been traditional to guarantee people to serve public. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very tough call on a lot of issues. Just clustered around that one point. 
Jeez, uh, anything more on email directories? Well, there is another system that you'll hear about called X.500. I hate it. Uh, X.500 is, is an attempt, uh, when I say not, by the way, it's one of, one of these. So you write it out as X.500. Uh, I have in the past characterized X.500 as an attempt by the Germans to make all the railroads run on time. Uh, <laughs> it really does inherently it really does inherently assume that the world can be divided cleanly hierarchically, which is why it will probably not succeed in the state, in my view. Uh, because what about the guy who has bi coastal offices, but he works for the same organization, or uh, how do you deal with things like street addresses? I mean, there is this assumption within X.500, and I won't go into any detail, that a person is part of either a geographical location or an organization that is part of a bigger one, is part of a bigger one, is part of a bigger one. And sometimes this doesn't work, or it doesn't work uniquely enough. Uh, there are places that are organizing on X.500 lines. It, it seems to be working for them. I, I'm just not sure it's, it's applicable across the board. It's really kind of emerging. So, mail locators, we have CSO, we have X.500 and some robotic type services like uh, oh, there's one called Yoohoo that knows how to run around and search both CSO and X.500 sites looking for a name. Uh, there's one called Nobot that does something the same thing. I mean, the basic idea is you launch this search process that knows about a whole lot of different databases and runs around and looks at them all. Again, it's not 100% inclusive. Uh, oh, boy, that brings us rather quickly to the end of the load. Uh, is everyone confused yet? <coughs> Anything in particular I can address, or is it just time to get the cold compress? Uh, moving on to the third generation. Uh, yeah, sure. Over here on uh, underneath Telenet, you're talking about gateway. Now, does that mean, is, what, is that what you need to know in order, let me ask the question another way. <coughs> One of the things I was wondering about is how it is you find these libraries around the country where you can look in their card catalog. So is this what I'm, is that what I'm... Yes, that is a thing that would be useful to you. Uh, I make a sort of fine intellectual distinction. Uh, between what I call locators and what I call concentrators. Uh, and they have basically to do with how you're approaching the information, which is what makes it an intellectual conceit rather than a technical reality. Uh, in the Tom Bruce view of the world, a locator is something that goes out in, in sort of hunt mode and does a rifle shot search for a specific resource. Whereas a concentrator is a place in which you might reasonably expect to find a lot of resources specific resources of a particular kind, a sort of information Kmart, right, where you can go in and find listings of all the library catalogs. So it's in, in, in essence concentrating those resources, with, uh, it, and it does serve a locator function, obviously, but, but it's a kind of different animal. And what makes it different is, is how you yourself are approaching it. Like, am I hunting or am I browsing? It, it, it's really the question. And yes, the, uh, <clears throat> the gateway software for libraries is indeed a way of concentrating those resources in one place. So I can tell them that the one place that tells me about a whole lot of other places I can tell them that too for a particular purpose. In this case, accessing online library catalogs. Yeah. I uh, just um, got an interesting email message from someone who said that he fingered me. <laughs> Did he use anonymous FTP? <laughs> no, it was a situation where I had sent my email address to this person as, as part of registering for some shareware, and he was trying to send me the upgrade over the internet. It, my address bounced back, he thought it was a bad address, but then he was able to finger me, and then he got it through to me. And I thought, that's an interesting turn. Uh -huh. and what turn? <laughs> okay, it's, it's finger in the 1930s detective novel sense. Okay, first of all, uh, <laughs> before you get too concerned, you start wearing rubber gloves and I'm uh, <clears throat> What Finger is, is <clears throat> it's a little program that, that exists in the Unix world that allows you to hit a machine and say, so what about this guy? 
what about this user so and so? And if it is enabled uh, on that system, the system spits back a certain amount of information about you, what your specific email address is, what was the last time you logged onto the system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are, of course, ways of attaching cute messages to that so that the world can see when they finger you and so on. That's basically the message. Uh, it's, How much information is, is sent back or something like that? Those privacy questions you're bringing up before? Uh, generally, username, last, at least username, last time logged in, uh, how long on the system in this session, uh, email address. How much information does someone have to have in order to, to generate this uh, feedback? Just what machine you kind of live on. And, and then some some sense of what your address is to begin with or something you work with? Yeah, I mean, what, what machine you habitually use. They do have to know your user. But those are usually pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of systems, like increasing numbers of system administrators have disabled the computer capability, in part because of privacy issues largely because of my, uh, the activities of my Cornell colleague, Robert Tappet Morris, who in 1988 used the capabilities of the finger program to bring the internet to its needs. You don't find a lot of people running the internet. Uh, or you find a lot of people who will like to uh, Oh, third generation, ouch. Uh, at this point, everybody on the internet, oh, yeah. yeah. Question before you go too much further. With this whole FTP and Telnet and everything else that you're supposed to be able to have access to, are you going to discuss at all what it is that we need to be able to do that? We could sure go into that later. I mean, I can send an email messages. That was a major accomplishment that I was able to send an email message outside of the state. But they tell me I'm supposed to have those capabilities as well. Mm -hmm. So don't give me the little secret handshake or something that I need. <laughs> uh, I why would, or don't I? And if I don't, what do I need? I will be brutally honest in answering your question. It's not an attempt to either dodge it or slap it. Uh, the problem is that for me to address that specifically, so much a product of your local situation that yeah, we can probably sit down later with two of us and figure out what it is that's missing. But it is so much a product of the way that local system, the local systems are set up and administered that the chances are good that the information I give you will be bad. Sort of like you're it's a, it's sort of like you're coming to me and saying, Well, tell me what's in my clothes closet at home. I, 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 I we can talk and I think we can probably figure out a good part of it. But unfortunately that's really one of those places where I have to say you know, somewhere on your campus is a you know who is hiding this information from you. And your job is to hunt this person down in person. I know who that person is. <laughs> I'll work on that. Mr. Mr. Austin had a little article. Okay. That's what we're talking about. Not your office. Because the problem is that in order to get the tools to go on, you have to get it. Yeah, I know. I've sat through a lot of these. You know, Pete says, as, as a class of first year kids, are terribly fond of recursion. And they find nothing at all strange in the notion of standing there and telling you, well, you know, if you want information on how to access the internet, well, you can find it all on the internet. Uh, they see nothing strange in this. Uh, I, uh, incidentally, included in the handout is a rather extensive bibliography of print resources regarding the internet that have information about the internet that is not on the internet, but actually available in the printed form. Uh, and you might want to follow up on some of those. And in fact, anybody, I, I, I don't mean, I didn't mean to be harsh, anybody who does want to ask me questions about local access issues, I, I, we, we can certainly talk. Uh, I'm not sure how helpful I'll be, uh, but it is by no means a universal very much a product of the local setup. We can read this down. Everybody on the net at this point in history was just exactly as confused as you are now and said, why the hell do we have to know where all these specific resources are in order to access them? And we sort of have located and, 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 and why do we have to know 
all these different protocols. Uh, and it was at that point that we really began moving into uh, the third generation of stuff, which was applications that were designed not to use locators, to build in their own locators. They didn't require a sort of two-step operation where first the end user like, found the thing with Archie and then used FTP to go get it. Uh, some of that linkage was built in. The idea was you didn't have to care where you were on the net anymore. You just had to sort of have fun with it. The first of those, uh, and this is really a very recent development. This is within the last year or two years. The first of those was a system from uh, the University of Minnesota, uh, written, as I understand it, by a bunch of renegades who were resisting the official notion of campus-wide information by building their own, uh, called Gopher, named after the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Uh, and also after the fact that it was used to go for things on the net. Uh, we'll look at a couple of them after, after a break to get some idea of what these little suckers actually do. Uh, plus the basic idea is that they, they know how to do, let's say, four things. They can deliver text to an end user. They can deliver searchable text to an end user. They can respond to a, a text search query. Uh, they can deliver interactive sessions by firing a telnet, and they can point at other gophers. So that one can sort of instantly pop from a menu choice on one gopher to another gopher over here to another gopher over there across the net. Uh, this is a simple idea, but as, as we'll see, uh, it's a fantastically powerful one. Uh, finally, the fourth generation, and this is this year, and specifically the last six months, goes yet a step beyond this and combines the idea of location independence and linking of resources across the map with protocol independence. And the end user not really having to care about data formats or how you access it or where it is. And that's the stuff that leads us to uh, the so-called World Wide Web and hypertext linking and uh, little things of that sort. What I want to do over the next few minutes is reorganize my list, which will become scattered as I start to rattle them up all the tools. Uh, let's take a few questions if there are any, and then let's take a stretch break. Questions? Yeah. I don't know if this pulls us way off in the direction that you might have. Well, there is no direction. Me, but, um, <laughs> I, I'm curious about this whole business of name server. Is the name server process where in some machine translates what you're typing in. Is it, autom is it automatic or does it have to learn right. that? Let's, let's talk about the naming system. I kind of went skating right past that. Uh, originally, it was the internet. Stands for Internet Protocol Address. And these are those funny numbers that you see. Picking around that look like 132.236.108.5. And that IP address identifies a specific machine, in this case, the one on my desktop, uh, in a way that is not terribly human readable, as you'll, as you'll recognize. This is machine number five on the 108 subnet, on the 236 subnet of 132 which happens to be subnets that are all owned by Cornell University. So if you were really super familiar with IP addresses, you could say, oh yeah, that's a Cornell machine. Uh, but it doesn't do a whole lot for human beings in terms of identifying what that machine is. If we had to operate that, we'd all go crazy. Uh, and that's where we get to what you were asking about, which is the, the so-called domain name system. Uh, it was clear that there had to be a better way of Identifying machines in a way that humans could understand. Uh, and that was how we very quickly got to the idea of domain names, which also identified machines. And you've seen a zillion of them. This one happens to be my machine, which for obscure reasons is called fakebake.law.cornell.2. And that's what 
someone got the idea, well, wouldn't it be nice if we had software that was capable of looking and knowing that 132.236.108.5 is big, big, and that big, big is et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And out of that came the idea of what you were asking about, which is a so-called domain name resolver, which is capable of taking one of these IP addresses and turning it into a machine name, or a machine name and turning it into uh, an IP address. And from that goes the notion of a domain name server, which was a machine that sat there and it essentially accepted questions from any and all comers saying, so tell me, what is the domain name for the machine that is 1332.236.108.5? We fire back an answer saying, oh, that's big, we've got a lot of we're not letting you do. Uh, you probably gathered from the way this is structured and from the handout if you're following along, that this is in fact organized hierarchically from left to right, narrow to wide, at least in the United States. Uh, Right, so Big Big is a machine that exists in some hypothetical region of cyberspace called law, within an institutional portion of cyberspace called Cornell, within a much larger domain called EDU, which happens to be all educational institutions. Uh, there are similar top-level domains for military installations, commercial operations, there are a bunch that work by the two-letter country code, like uh, CA from Canada and so forth and so on, uh, US for USA. And still an even more mixed bag that operates with .org addresses, meaning it's an organization, we don't know what it's done. Uh, right, so that, there's, there's the domain naming scheme in a nutshell, and you can see in the example that I've actually done a sort of DNS recasting of my street address to give you an idea of how this, this actually works. So if any of you want to send me a postcard, now you know. Did I somehow manage to touch on your question at all? Well, yes, the, the one question <laughs> that I saw, are all, is one name server as good as another, or are some smarter than others? Uh, actually, what, some are more authoritative for certain areas than others. Uh, with this idea of hierarchical domain <coughs> organization came the idea that questions about name resolution, what is the domain name for this IP address, should be answerable by a machine as quote unquote close to the requester as possible. So if I ask about an IP address in Cornell, it is answered by a Cornell machine. If I ask about one in Kent, unless it happens to have just been asked that information and kept it around in case somebody asks again, it's a, uh, it says, I don't know, let's ask the next guy up the chain. And the next guy up the chain says, well, I don't know that either, but I'll bet CICnet does. And CICnet says, well, I don't know either. Let's ask this one. So it works its way up the tree and then back down again. Right? It so it's a combination sense. of manual data entry and referral, I guess. Right? Exactly, exactly. And within your campus, probably the same Konami that you're looking for with murder in your eye, uh, is in fact somewhere on your campus there is somebody who is responsible for administering machine and domain names within your campus. Uh, at Cornell, they're known generically as the host master. Uh, <laughs> And you can, in fact, send mail to hostmaster at cornell.edu and, and get some sort of response. Uh, make sense? Mm -hmm. And it works out as other stories. For example, I ultimately decide what machines are named within the law domain of Cornell. I should admit that. Uh, <laughs> and somebody at Cornell decides that there can be a domain called law and one called something else, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there, again, there's administration within the EDU domain. Oh yeah, these guys at Cornell can have their own Cornell domain, and so forth and so on. It's really one of the few things about the net that is not utterly anarchic. Incomprehensible, yes, but anarchic, no. Uh, oh, and, so the base, but every machine has to have a number, but there's no way to well, I was I was I was carefully skipping around that point. In fact, uh, as, as Will is pointing out, IP addresses are unique to machines. Names are not. If I also want bigbrick.law.cornell.edu to be known, probably for purposes of advertising, what boils down to advertising, to the world as gopher.law.cornell.edu, so they have some intuitive idea where my gopher is running, I can do that. I can alias it. And I can pile up 10 aliases for it. Uh, this is frequently done with, by people who are running reliable services. Uh, well, for example, let's say you put your law library catalog up on some sort of internet machine. 
and you don't know. I mean, it's going to grow, and you're going to replace machinery, and you're going to get resubmitted nine times. And, and, and the long and, the long and short of it is, you think, well, it'd be a great idea if I could sort of move this from machine to machine if I felt like it. But every time I do that, I don't want to have to tell everybody out there that I moved it. So I'll just call it opac.law.somewhere.edu and change the machine that that name points to as I move my hardware around. So there's this basic idea of making the names independent of the specific box that it's running on. This is a very, 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 very important illustration of a very, very, very important internet principle, which is that so far as possible, you try to decouple things in ways like that as a way of promoting flexibility and reliability. I mean, and that's all the way from hardware standards on up. In fact, the network was originally designed by the Defense Department as something that could take medium yield nuclear kits in isolated locations without going down. True. Uh, these days, people tend to worry more about backhoes cutting fiber optics than they do about nukes, but uh, you know, that sort of principle of building something that was flexible, resilient, and reliable was in from the start, and it applies to naming schemes and everything else. So you're, you're, you've entered a world where uh, very deconstructionist world in a funny way, but the name of the name of the name of the name becomes important at the time. Yeah? Uh, in our uh, system, we have like a little quotation mark and letter MX and things like that. Is that part of this or is that mm -hmm. just a uh, where do you find those in email addresses? I, I told you as much as I know. I know that. Uh, I, know, I know it's kind of it more. <laughs> Outside. I thought it was just a vaccine-related thing or something related to that. So you have to do MX percent location. Oh, yeah, percent on location. Yeah. This is a wrapper scheme, what we call a wrapper scheme. And it, it always reminds me of my mother because my mother has never in her life sent a package that had one layer of brown paper. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think anyone's mother ever has. Um, <laughs> And it really is basically the same idea. The idea is that you want to distinguish traffic that's going outside the system from traffic that's remaining inside the system. We'll <coughs> our lands, for example. I told him that, but he didn't believe me. <coughs> so, you, so you end up with some wacky... <laughs> what you end up with is some wacky scheme that looks like this. Right? Here's my email address. This isn't my email address. Everybody thinks that's fine, but, uh, but it's not a local address. So some system administrator somewhere in their infinite wisdom decides that this thing should be surrounded by curly brackets, have a quote at each end, and say something in front of it to identify it, 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 it as an address outside the system. And you see this a lot now, particularly with uh, land-based mail systems like WordPerfect Office, uh, for example, that are gatelaying out to internet systems. I mean, you see all kinds of bizarre schemes. Do I just make any sense to you at all? Um, so that has nothing to do with the internet. That's just a school. Like it's it's a local thing, uh, but you'll see it. And, and in effect, what happens is the, the local machine gets a look at that, and says, "Oh well, that says MX percent in front of it. That must be something that's supposed to go outside." Strips off all the stuff that doesn't belong in an internet address and, and forwards it onward, just as if someone was unwrapping the package in two stages the way your mother wrapped it. Yeah. How long uh, do you think the internet is going to last before it's replaced by something a lot better and a lot more um, uh, um, address space and transmission uh, space? Oh boy. Uh, good question. There is a big, big, big debate right now about IP addresses uh, and whether or not we're likely to run out of them. I mean, obviously. Any of those numbers in one of those something, 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 dot, something, something, something sequences can only go as high as 255. So there is a finite limit on the number of actual machines you can have on the net. Uh, some people on the Internet Engineering Task Force are very worried about this issue. I actually, in one meeting I was at, said, well, it depends on what you think the limiting factor is. If it's proliferation of machines, it could happen by the end of the next week. If it's the speed at which Cornell University Central Computing employees can install network connections, we have nothing to worry about. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, your guess is as good as mine. And it, 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 there, really are, there really are a number of limiting factors operating here. 
as far as the gigabit speed networks and are we going to get NREN tomorrow and is everybody's life going to be transformed from better? Well, ask yourself this. You had a four-lane highway. You build a ten-lane highway. Does it let you drive faster or does it let more people drive? Again, open question. I'm sure that infrastructure that will support gigabit speeds will be here by 1995, almost everywhere. But whether that means any actual difference in performance for the end user, eh, who can say? Given that imaging is going to become uh, a lot more prevalent and important, uh, don't you think that is going to happen a lot faster than, uh, than slower? Maybe yes, maybe no. Depends on who pays. Uh, I mean, I think you can make a much, I, let's put it this way, I think you would find more of a congressional response for medical imaging right now than you would for shipping around copies of the Maastricht Treaty. <laughs> See what I mean? It, it gets into public policy very, very quickly. But everything that stands between us and them is dollars and not science, right? Pretty much. Standards and documents. Standards and documents, right? I mean, there's a certain amount of necessary debate about how are we going to do this. Uh, but that's been pretty quick, at least in the internet community. You'll notice that I have not mentioned the evil three-letter combination, OSI, which I'm sure some of you have heard, and the possible replacement for TCP IP in, in, in networking. Uh, the reason is that the OSI standards bodies have been meeting for 14 years and have yet to produce a usable software product. <laughs> and even though government, the government is mandating compliance with OSI standards by whenever, I don't know. Will, is there anybody in the networking community who still seriously believes that that's going to happen? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or what is OSI? OSI, the Open Systems Interconnection Protocol. It was designed to be the next latest, greatest replacement for TCP IP, and it's essentially another way of shipping so-called data packets. Uh, and it was designed to be an international, open, non-proprietary standard that, of course, has been fiercely debated in standards committees forever. Any of you have been involved with uh, any of the uh, old Marvy activities or any of the people who do things with bibliographic records uh, will probably recognize instantly how long these debates can be for long. Uh, Mark Standard Records and that kind of thing. Thank you, no matter where you go. Uh, more questions? When's our break? <laughs> <laughs> now! <laughs> <laughs> no, that's exactly from. Right, so for some reason, I discovered earlier today, if I start I can get names of the black person solid on my shoes. Using a, a newfangled uh, piece of internet software to simulate an old thing, piece of internet software. And, and what I've done here is, in fact, logged into one of my machines at Cornell as a way of showing you some of what the bad old days uh, used to look like with things like anonymous FTP and Telnet and so forth and so on. Uh, it's a little easier than trying to negotiate my way through Kent's system to do it in the same sort of way that, that, that you would see it. Uh, on your native machine. Uh, I'm sort of at your pleasure here as to what we should would focus on. We can go back and look at any of those first generation applications we mentioned. We can play treasure hunt. We can look at some newer stuff. It's really pretty much up to you as to, as to what you'd like to see at this point or, or what might help clear up any points of confusion you have after that admittedly confused and headlong exposition in the first part of the session. Uh, yeah. Well, I'd like you to look for a book in a library somewhere. Like, okay. Okay. Can you like the Library of Congress or something like that? Uh, let me let us just approach that from about six different perspectives. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> using six different software tools. Uh, I will use. Uh, let's not necessarily do the library sequentially of because sequentially. I don't remember its address right off the top of my head. There are others that I do. Uh, if I wanted to, let's say, go look for uh, an online catalog somewhere, because I have secret and private knowledge, I know that there's something called wgate.wstl.edu, which is the Washington University Gateway at Washington University St. Louis Educational Institution. After a while, you get to where you can sort of get these things. 
Why would you spell that? I would say Conan Fugate that was called EDU. Now, how did I get that knowledge? Well, in my case, through experience, but there are, as I mentioned, paper lists and paper documentation to tell you about these things. A particularly good one is that Ed Kroll book that's in the bibliography that I handed out. He's got a nice little resource directory in the back of that thing. Uh, the LeQuay book also has quite a few. The LeQuay beginner's book. Uh, if you want to publish, if you want to get those. So, from a command line prompt, I do this. It, it gets it. Because I have secret and outside knowledge, I know that to get into this system, I have to log uh, in the library. I have to log in the library. Now I don't. <laughs> yes, I do. And this is what I see. Uh-oh, it's asking me what my terminal type is. Uh, <clears throat> again, because I have secret and private knowledge, I know that I am emulating a VT100 at the moment, which happens to be a rather old terminal made by Jack and sort of a plain vanilla internet-ish kind of thing. But one thing that you will need to know as you go cruising around is what terminal emulation you are using. Uh, and this can be a little tricky, uh, because how many of you actually dial into other systems to start Telnet, like some university VAX or something of that sort. Ah, see what's operative at that point, if you're doing Telnet off the VAX, is what emulation the VAX thinks you are using, thinks it's using, rather than the software that you're using to dial the VAX. So let's say I'm using Procom or something like that. Is that a familiar software package for a lot of people? I can have my Procom terminal emulation set to BT100, happily dial up my VAX, tell my VAX to go out and do Telnet for me and have the VAX think that it's being something else altogether. In which case the stuff will come back to me as that sort of familiar Nepalese algebra we've all seen when we uh, get terminal emulation so on. Uh, and I will try to fix this by changing the emulation on my Procom software and it won't do a damn thing because the VAX still thinks that the VAX thought whatever it was. Now, everybody who reads TechNoise knows very well that I don't know enough about VMS be able to tell you how to change your terminal emulation. Uh, but you can do it. Anybody know VMS law? Know how to change the terminal emulation? That term is set. So, having known that I'm a VT100 and accepted the default, I get this nicely menuized thing that they're giving me here. And I want to look for a library in the United States. And I want to look for one in New York. Can I just jump in with a question here? Yep. Are most of these menu-driven once you access them? Gateways are. Okay. Uh, online catalogs almost always are because end users have to use them. Okay. The problem is that the menuing systems that are used at the specific OPAC are set up by the manufacturer of the OPAC so that ones that use notice don't work the same way as ones that use NOPAC, as ones that use this, as ones that use that. So there's no sort of one-shot solution to telling end users what to do once they get into a catalog. They're all kind of different, depending on who made them. Uh, and I decided I want to go to Cornell. Yeah. Oh, Cornell. Oh, sound stupid, but I will say it anyway. Your biggest ally as you navigate the internet is actually reading the screen. <laughs> uh, and those of you who, uh, I see some knowing nods out here. Those of you who have actually had to deal with end users know that they do not read screens uh, for reasons that are sort of obscure to me, but they don't. Uh, be your friend. What it's telling me right now is if I want to connect to the system, all I have to do is press C. It says that at the bottom right. And so I'm going to do that. And lo and behold, it's connected me to the final system. Now I have private knowledge of how to log into this. And now I'm looking at what looks like 
yet another notice screen that has been revised by a bunch of librarians. Uh, <laughs> all of them slightly different. Uh, and I could go from here to do all searches or whatever. You, had, you said, that said you had to have uh, not anybody to do that because I need to have authorization by from Cornell in advance to get anything out of that. Is that true? No, not true. Uh, not true. What you saw was a standard unauthorized user shouldn't use this system. The Cornell puts there as a legal notice to remove itself uh, from any liability that might result. You'll see a lot of that. Well, I can look up all these things written by people named Bruce and, and so forth and so on. I mean, at this point, I'm into that, that OPAC system, and it is whatever it is. So that's shot one at going and looking for a library resource. It's pretty easy if you go through a gateway. Obviously, as you can see from the menus we made our way through there, we had some things, and we didn't have some other things. One of the things we had was a way of getting at a lot of different OPACs from one place. One thing we didn't have, unless we read very carefully and took notes as we did so, <coughs> Uh, was information about how to actually log into the thing once we'd established a connection with it. I mean, I said I'm using private knowledge here, uh, and that's true. Uh, there weren't a lot of instructions along the way to tell me what to do. Partly that's the design of the local system, partly that's you know, how, much, how much capability your menuing system had to tell people what to do when they're working with that familiar resource. Uh, and if I say X from that to exit, I find myself back in the scrambled Wugate screen. And I quit from Wugate and I'm back at my machine in Cornell. There's another way I can do this. Well, I want to use Gopher. And now I'm running Gopher on my, my Unix machine at Cornell. I can do that and look at a root Gopher menu that, that we've set up to point out a bunch of different internet resources, one of which or someplace or other, library resources on my catalog. And it happens to contain a pointer both directly to the Cornell online catalog that's identified as a Talmud session, and a pointer to Wilgate. And indeed, if I fire this thing off to Wilgate, it gives me a little better information here. It tells me I'm about to access another system. It tells me that I need to tell it library to log in. Uh, and in fact, if I do that, I find myself looking at something that looks oddly familiar because I'm doing exactly what I did a second ago. I'm just doing it with a slightly, slightly more user-friendly front end. Now, if we go back to our friend the Gopher, a second. Tom? Yeah? That was something Cornell created? Yes. Now, what if every school doesn't have one of those? Then they should get them. Yes, I mean, this is something that we have, but that is nonetheless accessible to you across the network. Is that something that each personal computer has to have, or is it on the mainframe? Ah, glad you asked that question, because now we get into a very, very, very important notion uh, called client-server. You've heard this. Uh, yeah. I heard a great quote recently to the effect that client server is not just a buzzword, it's two buzzwords. <laughs> uh, and in fact, that's true. Basically, the, con the concepts are really simple, and I sort of alluded to them when I was talking about protocols earlier. It's an intellectual conceit, uh, in a way. The idea is that you have client software and you have server software. Uh, server software is uh, is software that delivers some sort of resource, serves it up. Client software is, as you might expect, software that knows how to request a particular resource. So, unlike the menuing systems you know and love, uh, when we talk about something like Gopher, what you have at your school is a generalized Gopher client that knows just enough to call up my server and say, give me a menu, pal whatever menu happens to be there. And it responds with a menu. And it looks at that menu and it says, okay, well, I want number six. So it hits my server and says, give me number six on that menu you just gave me. And it responds with whatever that is. So it, it, you 
you see how this bears on the question you were asking? The menu is maintained by me, and it is whatever I say it is. There is no installation on your local machine, but you must have software that, that knows how to be a client for that and call up and, S and in essence say, give me a menu. Am I making sense? Okay. So uh, this concept of mainframe, boy, that gets really elusive. Uh, and and you'll, you'll see why in a second. If I go down here and say other internet law sites, let's see if Sandler's done his work. Uh, I've got other internet law sites. Now, this is a menu that just came to me off my machine of, of, of other internet law sites that I happen to have put here. And I go and look at Indiana Law School's jumper. And it comes back with a menu. Now, that's on Will's machine. Because all that is on my machine is a pointer saying, go to Will's machine and get a menu which it has just done. So what, what mainframe is involved here? Let me go back to my original drawings. This is your brain on the internet. It's not as if we're going out to some massive West-operated computer out there that has everything on it. We're going to a little computer that knows how to point to another little computer that knows how to point to another little computer that knows how to point to another little computer. So this mainframe idea is really kind of a cloud. The, 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 it's a distributed system, and the information we can deliver is the sum total of the information on any number of machines. Where is the go for software maintained? I have dial-up access into my academic computer. They're mm -hmm. all laughed. I <laughs> <laughs> um, dial-up access into my academic computing service office. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they maintain the go for software? They might. Is it something that they might. at the law school could go, have? Well, yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> Gopher server software exists for any number of hardware platforms now, including DOS, Unix, and Macintosh. You can run a Gopher server from a network one of any one of those kinds of PCs. In fact, Wills is running on an Intel PC. Which must have cost about $99. <laughs> I, I, I mean, seriously, and, and the economics of this are just not. Mine's running on a Unix box, it costs a bit more than that. Uh, a buddy of mine over at Material Science is running one on a Mac SE. And they all look the same. You know, from this perspective, they all look the same. Let's talk about economics for a second on Will's $99 machine. It costs the Cornell Law School somewhere between thirty dollars and $40,000 per annum to find, print, Distribute the two law journals and other occasional stuff that runs out of the Cornell Law School. I can buy a Unix box and pay someone to run it for a year and pay all my networking costs considerably less than that. Uh, and what I'm getting at is the notion that there is a powerful incentive to get into this as a provider. A powerful economic incentive. Will's costs are even less. I mean, I'm doing this with something like two gigabytes of storage available to me, and I can put a lot of money, a lot of money for that kind of money. Uh, someone asked me in the break, who pays for all of this? And the answer is, in some sense, we all do. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll get to the specifics of that in a while, but my own view is that when people start asking ugly questions about, is, the inter is it worth it to access the internet? Is it worth it to pay for that infrastructure? I, I feel awkward about adopting the time-honored technologist's answer of saying the only way out is through when you have to invest in this much more technology to get these benefits from the first technology you bought. I mean, that always makes me feel kind of stupid like the scam artist I basically am. Uh, but I think in this case it happens to be true. The future here really is resource sharing amongst law schools, between law schools and the profession, and that an investment now in the infrastructure to do the communication is going to pay off massively down the road. Uh, I mean, just think about what we just saw in Wugate in terms of the amount of time that your interlibrary loan specialists are spending running around looking for stuff at this point. I mean, think about the hidden cost you're offsetting there, right at that one thing. Uh, and, you know, if you're looking for justification, I guess it's really tough. There was a question back here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you may have already said this, so forgive me if I'm asking a stupid question, but is what we're seeing here analogous to writing like a text file that is a menu in DOS. So in fact, what's behind the, about this Indiana Law School go for choice, 
we choose that. It is a regular old DOS text file that's sitting on Will's machine, and what's behind one of the submenu choices is a directory substructure that he's set up. So now I don't know the DOS thing well enough to read the comments in the directory. Each file, each directory has to have a file that's based on the DOS. Yeah, so there's a and there are obviously other capabilities there. We saw it launch a Telnet session. Uh, there are other files that you set up that say, I am a pointer to another resource somewhere. Right? So you have three things, basically. Files, directories, and, and so-called link files that, uh, that work much like the kind of thing you use to structure menus on a bus machine. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just a little text file that says, put this behind this menu choice. Make sense? Yeah. And you're just you're just making it simply easier. You're hiding a complicated command with a choice. Exactly. I mean, there is a, there, there is a very real sense that Gopher is nothing more than a jumped up menu system that knows how to talk to jumped up menu systems on other machines. Couldn't be simpler in concept. It's one of the reasons it's been so enormously popular. A year ago, when we began ran, running our Gopher, I think there were probably 35 registered Gopher sites with Minnesota by registered. I think mean, people actually told Minnesota that they were running Gophers. They're now 1,200 a year later. It's very popular. It's way it works stuff. Yeah? What's the difference between Gophers like Wade and Gophers? Yes, Al. All three of them. Boy, did you ever ask the right question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs>